so good to be with you guys this morning. Um, as Tabitha mentioned, we're in Revelation chapter 11, so I encourage you to grab your Bibles and turn there with me this morning. But didn't Tabitha do a great job? Yeah. yeah. She, uh, she was a little nervous about getting in front of you sweet, precious people. I don't know why, but um, she's been serving as our Connections Coordinator um, here at the church, doing such a great job. And if you need to get connected in the life of our church, we have so many wonderful team members that volunteer, that serve on staff here. So many great opportunities to get connected, but uh, Tabitha is a great point of contact. So if you're not in a small group or want to find out more about the next First Steps, which is just an opportunity if you're new to the area, new to the church, want to discover a little bit more about our church and kind of discern if this is a good fit, it's, a, it's something we do about five or six times a year. Tabitha is a great person to connect with, but uh, for any of those things. And Connect Groups began meeting this week, and it's just been amazing. I think we had 14 people do Zumba on Friday night, which is fun. Um, but we have so many groups that are Bible study groups, kind of common interest groups, um, so many opportunities to connect within the life of the church this fall, um, and just been hearing great reports of what God's doing in developing those relationships and those times together um, in God's Word. So I want to encourage you, if you're not yet connected, Connect with Tabitha after the service. It'll be a great time to, uh, to get plugged in. Well, Revelation chapter 11 is where we'll pick up our study in God's Word this morning. And if, if you're new to the fellowship or just kind of stepping into this series with us, it's really our rhythm as a church to walk through books of the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And if you've come, maybe this is your first Sunday, and you're like, Revelation chapter 11. Two witnesses that act like Godzilla. Fire comes from their mouth. What an interesting Sunday to visit. Um, our rhythm is to walk through books of the Bible. So let me just share this. It'll be a reminder for many of us, but I think it's a good reminder as we consider this text this morning. You know, the book of Revelation oftentimes can be cherry-picked. What I mean by that is chapter one is amazing. Like that podcast intro that you saw with David Guzik, where the question was asked, you know, what's the theme, the focus? What, is, what does Revelation give to us? And, and David said something that I think was very, very insightful, that it reveals to us a kind of a, an extra dimension or layer or perspective of who Jesus is that the Gospels don't necessarily reveal. You see, in chapter one of the book of Revelation, we see Jesus as he is now resurrected in authority, in glory, and in power. And it's awesome. Chapter 1, verse 19, John, the author of this book, is given what many have called kind of the divine outline of the book, how it unfolds. And in chapter 1, John is told to write the things that he's seeing. And what he's seeing is Jesus revealed in glory, authority, power, perfection. And then in that verse, verse 19 of chapter 1, John is told to write the things that are. And there's seven churches at that time that John writes to. And such amazing messages that Jesus gives to these seven churches. And they're very applicable to the modern church today. And then from chapters 4 on through 19, this is the section we're in presently, chapter 11, kind of right in the thick of it, we're considering the things that are yet to come. And specifically those chapters, chapters 4 through 19, focus on a time period that the Old Testament speaks of to great degree, the Great Tribulation. A time where God's mercy and his justice will come together. You see, right now, I really believe that as the church, we live in what many would call the age of grace. Jesus has resurrected. He's ascended into heaven. He's given his Holy Spirit. And he's commissioned you and me as the church to love him. Don't you love that? That that's where it starts to be in relationship with God, to be in community, to be a part of a fellowship, but also to be about his mission. The New Testament would call it the Great Commission, meaning this is the mission of Jesus and you're brought into it with him to go and make 
disciples. If you've ever wondered, what's the purpose of this season of my life? Here it is. Know that God loves you and he wants a relationship with you. That never goes away. Know that he's called you to be connected together with his people, to be a part of the family of God in a local church and know that there's purpose to your day to see disciples made. See, we're in this age of grace where that's the rhythm, that's the agenda, that's the focus of your life and mine, a relationship with God and his people. Some people call that the great commandment, to love God and love others, and then to be about the great commission. If you go, well, that's why I'm so empty. I'm not about that at all. I'm about loving myself, amassing things for myself, and kind of just focused on my life. That's the fast track to misery as a believer. But to be about loving God, loving people, and making disciples, that's the sweet spot of life as a believer. But see, in Revelation chapter 4 through 19, I do believe there'll be a new age that's coming. So what is it? The Great Tribulation, where God does bring justice, judgment, a conclusion to the time that this planet has. And this morning... As we're in chapter 11, we will see that God's program and agenda is very much to wake up a nation, the nation of Israel, and to shake up a people group who don't yet follow him. And as we get into chapter 11 this morning, I want to draw your attention to actually the last verse of the previous chapter. Look at chapter 10, verse 11. This kind of sets the stage for what we'll see this morning in chapter 11. Verse 11 says of chapter 10, I was told you must prophesy again, speaking to John, about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. And this is what happens in chapter 11. John prophesies about a people, a nation, and in a tongue concerning the events of Israel and what's known as the tribulation temple. You see, According to chapter 10, verse 6, there in chapter 10 of the book of Revelation, we see that now in this time of the great tribulation that God is going to begin to focus and to finalize his wrath upon the world. And as he does, his attention, his focus is on the nation of Israel. And we'll see this morning the temple. Now, the attention and centerpiece of Israel in the end days, this is a theme throughout the Old Testament. I don't know if you've had a chance to check out some of the content from last weekend when we had that Enduring Word weekend with Pastor David Guzik, or you were here last Sunday, but we were reminded last week that the book of Revelation contains 500, 500 allusions to the Old Testament, 70% of what's in the book of Revelation, 278 of the 404 verses that make up the book make reference to the Old Testament. The book of Revelation is is like a culmination, a revealing of what was prophesied in the Old Testament about God's judgment. Zechariah chapter 12 and 14 reveals some of these judgments upon Israel and their enemies. One author put it this way, Israel during this time, the great tribulation that is to come, will become the storm center of the world during the tribulation period. And for the religious Jews, kind of the heart and soul of their religion is the temple. And they strongly desire to see the temple rebuilt. You see, In the Old Testament, we know that there was a first temple that was built that was glorious. Pop quiz. Let's see if anyone knows who built that very first temple. His name rhymes with Molomon. (laughs) Solomon. Yes. Solomon. For the Jewish people. Boy, that's the golden age of their reign. When Solomon reigned, silver, it says in the Old Testament, was so readily available, it was like rocks in Israel. Anyone ever been to the Middle East? Rocks are abundant, right? In Solomon's time, when he dedicated and built the temple, it was so beautiful, so magnificent. People would travel from all over the world to see the reign and rule 
of Solomon. That temple lasted for 400 years. It spoke of, na of the nation's ability, their resilience, but also, most importantly, their God. Well, if you know your Bible, if you know your Old Testament history, the people of Israel, they wandered from God. God brought judgment. They were brought into captivity. That's why we have all those Old Testament prophets. You could break down the prophets of the Old Testament around this is what's known as the exile, the time where God's people are brought out from the land that was promised. There were, and these are just Bible terms if you want to use them, there were pre-exilic prophets, like before the exile happened. God sent prophets to warn his people, change, judgment's coming. And they go, uh-huh, they don't listen. And then there were exilic prophets, prophets that spoke to God's people while they were in exile, while they were in Babylon. And then there were post-exilic prophets, prophets that spoke to God's people after they were in exile. Those are the prophets of the Old Testament. And God sent them to bring his people back to a place where they would walk in love and obedience. But Solomon's temple was destroyed when they were brought into exile. Now, there was a second temple that was built. Anyone ever heard of Jesus? Been to church? Yes. Well, in the Gospels, you may remember that there was a temple that was built. That wasn't the temple of Solomon. That was the temple of Zerubbabel. Maybe you were here when we walked through the book of Nehemiah. During the time of Ezra and Nehemiah was when that temple was rebuilt, and it was smaller, not as grandiose as the temple of Solomon. So in the Roman rule, there was a king named Herod who added on to that temple, and that would have been the temple in place when Jesus was alive. But perhaps you remember, Jesus shared that that temple would be destroyed. And if you know your history in A.D. 70, that temple, too, was brought to nothing. Now, you may or may not remember this, but when John's writing the book of Revelation, most individuals believe it's right around the time of 90 to 95 AD. And we'll see in Revelation 11 this morning, he's speaking about a temple. Because the Bible does speak of a future temple that will be built. Today, if you go to Israel, there is no temple where the religious Jews can gather but the Old Testament prophet of Daniel, he declared and prophesied that a temple will be rebuilt and will be in use by the time of the tribulation. Jesus, in Matthew 24, he affirmed this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the apostle Paul says that the temple will be rebuilt. And as he's often known of, the man of sin, or we may, may call him the Antichrist, he will defile it. See, that's some of what we're going to look at this morning in Revelation 11. The centerpiece begins to focus on the nation of Israel and the temple. And the heart and soul of the religious Jews centers around the temple. They desperately want to see it rebuilt and rebuilt in the place where those first two stood. But there's a challenge, in fact, more than one challenge, to having the temple rebuilt on its original location. See, the believed site for the temple is the same site for the existing Dome of the Rock mosque. And the Dome of the Rock, I don't know if you know this, kind of a big deal to the Islamic faith. It's the third holiest site just after Mecca in Medina for the Islamic faith. And I'm sure that'll be a simple fix, right? Like when it's time to build the temple. <laughs> I'm sure that the Jews and the Muslims will get together over some kosher meat and work out a plan, right? That's been the history in that part of the world. You see, Muslims believe that the prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven from the rock that sits in the middle of that domed shrine. That's where the name comes from, the Dome of the Rock. And they believe that they will incur the wrath of their God, Allah, if they give up that location. This is a problem for the Jews who long to see the temple reestablished. But I found this interesting. Years ago, there was a professor from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, his name is Dr. Asher Kaufman, and he provided some very controversial research that actually places the, the original location of those two previous temples just a little bit north of where the Dome of the Rock stands. There's many archaeologists that would disagree with him, but here's what I find interesting. It's possible 
that a future temple could be built on that spot about 100 yards from where the Dome of the Rock sits. And as Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 says, the Antichrist or the man of sin, he will one day come on the scene and he might have that kosher meal with those of the Islamic faith and Jewish and bring them together at a place where there's a peace agreement in the Middle East. And his plan will allow for the Jews to rebuild their temple, potentially near the Dome of the Rock. That kind of fits within the scenario of what we read in Revelation 11. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. It says in verse 1 of chapter 11, John speaking, I was given a measuring stick and I was told, go and measure the temple of God, the altar, and count the number of worshipers. But... Do not measure the outer courtyard, for it's been turned over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. John is given a measuring stick to measure the temple, the altar, the worshipers there, but not to measure the outer court, because as it says here, it's been given to the nations, and they will trample on that holy city for 42 months, the word tells us. That city is none other than the city of Jerusalem. But you see, not only does this text seem to indicate that there could be a scenario where the temple and the dome function side by side, but this coincides with what Jesus taught in Matthew 24, that, that the Gentiles will control Jerusalem and the temple during the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. But it's interesting there's another layer, another dynamic of John being given this measuring stick and being told to measure the temple, the altar, and the people worshiping. See, God will measure. He'll evaluate. He'll count, so to speak, the worshipers that are gathered in that temple. Who are they worshiping? Or are they worshiping Jesus? Well, these worshipers, it says, when he says measure the altar, they have a brazen altar there. And again, like I mentioned, Revelation reaches so much back to what's going on in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the brazen altar wasn't a place of worship. It was a place of sacrifice, not in the sense of worship like song and prayers, but sacrifice. So in this altar, at this temple, Animal sacrifice, that will be the element of worship, a kind of a reversion back to the Old Testament system. So these worshipers are not worshiping God like you and I are in this morning by his spirit, because of his grace, because of what his son has done for us on the cross. No, they're coming back unto that Old Testament system of law. And what happens here? God measures. He pays attention. He sees the heart. And here's something I want to say just at this moment. God has every right to be the judge. He has every right to measure, to account. You see, in the Old Testament, this idea of measuring communicated ownership. And when the temple is measured, it's not like he's just saying, man, I wonder who they're worshiping in there. Go check it out, John. Get a measuring stick. See what's going on over there. But it's also communicating ownership. That he knows every dimension, that he's in charge. And let me see if I can say this very, very clearly. God is in charge. This is one of the primary themes of the Bible. What do you mean? You know how the Bible opens up? In the beginning, you created your own truth in your own, no. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, one of the most ancient pieces of literature we have in the Old Testament, meaning when it was first written, The book of Genesis gives us an account of creation, but the book of Job, most scholars believe, was one of the first books ever written. And you know what that book deals with, among other things? Pain, 
suffering, a sense of inequality in life, where, where maybe one feels like they've been slighted or God is not paying attention to the details and the struggles in their own life. The book of Job, where Job is this man that's blessed and then God allows a season of testing. And as you read through that book, it's a challenging book to read through. There comes a time where Job begins to ask God questions about what's happening. And I want to read this to you. In fact, I would encourage you, if you have the time, to, to pick up Job chapter 38, 39, and 40. It gives great insight into who God is. But I'll just read some of it to you. God answers some of Job's questions, nay, his complaints. In Job 38, verse 1, this is what he says. The Lord answered Job from a whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Can you imagine hearing this next phrase from God? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you. Like, Whoa, okay. Um, here are the questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determines its dimensions and stretched out its surveying line? What supports the foundations? Who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. That's how it begins. And if you walk through the rest of chapter 38 and 39, God gives great detail in the kind of attentiveness, focus, authority, care that he has for creation. In chapter 40, Job finally responds in verses 1 and 2, and he says this, after the Lord says, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? And this is what Job says, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I'm going to cover my mouth with my hand. I've said too much already. I have nothing more to say. Why do I share this? I think there needs to be a reawakening to the fact of who God is within this generation, that he's in control and that he's in charge. And the sooner that we embrace this in every aspect of, every aspect of our lives, the sooner we live in this reality in alignment with this truth, this truth brings freedom. God's in charge. I can trust him. And I'm a part of his story. He's not the supporting actor in my story. You know, as I was kind of scrolling through social media this week, I came across this video reel from my old high school youth pastor. And I thought he expressed very well how this generation struggles with this truth that God is God and he gets to define who we are. Let me share it with you. It's only 40 seconds long. Check it out. Today about like self-expression and being your truest self and my lived reality and all that. All, that's all fancy talk for being, I'm God. <laughs> I'm God. And I'm going to define reality, and I'm going to say who I am and what I want to be. It's like, all right, knock yourself out. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to be so stressed. You're going to be so anxious. You're going to be so freaked out. It's all about my identity. You'll never find yourself. The only one who can tell you who you are is God. So keep doing that. Keep, keep doing the self-expression and all that, and you're, going to be, and you're going to drive yourself crazy. Or you could just bow down before Jesus and let him be God and let him tell you who you are. Yeah, that's where the clap. Yeah, I think that's good. See, I know you're nervous because we've only gotten into two verses and it's a little late. I know where we are. That's okay. It's going to be all right. But I, I think this point needs to be owned. Like, and you need to be reminded of where we are in the book of Revelation. And you need to be reminded of who God is. He's God. God created the heavens and the earth. God is in charge. He sees the big picture. My life needs to fall in alignment with his mission, not try to encourage him to become part of my agenda. And like was mentioned on the video, you're going to be so anxious, so freaked out, so wondered what you're supposed to do. Just fall in line. Love him, connect with him, serve him. That's the purpose of your being. That's the purpose of who you are. This is one of the glorious, mighty themes of the book of Revelation. God is in charge. God is in charge. And when everything seemingly seems to be spinning out of control, I can stay self-controlled because I know who's in control. 
God is in charge. That's called the fruit of the spirit of self-control. I can stay self-controlled because I know who's in control. I trust him. It comes from faith. And God, as the rightful, righteous judge, has the ability and the authority to rule with justice and mercy. But as we begin to walk through chapter 11, we'll see in, in his mercy, here's what he does. He gives two witnesses to the people. Let's look at verses 3 through 6 as we consider these witnesses that God gives out of his mercy. He says in Revelation 11, verse 3, I will give power to my two witnesses. They will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during those 1,260 days. And these two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the sky so that no rain will fall as long as they prophesy and they have power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. God raises up two witnesses. God does this throughout Scripture. You may remember from Acts chapter 14 where Paul makes this statement that God never leaves himself without a witness. You see that throughout the Bible. Noah in the flood, Lot in Sodom, Elijah on Mount Carmel, Esther in Babylon. In the book of Revelation, the 144,000 witnesses that are going throughout all the globe, those 144,000, they're going throughout the earth at this time, giving witness and testimony to who Jesus is. But God raises up these two special witnesses for the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. And these witnesses are clothed in burlap. Like this isn't a Kanye fashion comeback. Like that's not what this is. But it symbolizes repentance. For 1,260 days, if you follow a 360-day calendar, which most would during this time, that's exactly three and a half years. For three and a half years, half of the tribulation, these two witnesses are delivering a powerful and a potent message of what? It's on their clothes. Repent. Come back to God. Now, what does this mean? That these are the olive trees and the lampstands. I won't belabor this point. In fact, one of the things we've been trying to do through the book of Revelation is make teaching notes available. So if you're like, man, I'd like to dig into this more, you can pick up a, a physical copy out in the Connect desk this morning or everything's available online. But the book of Zechariah chapter 4 gives great insight into what this means. And let me see if I can summarize it for the sake of time. These men are filled with the Holy Spirit of God and they're sent to be lights in a dark world. Does that sound like anybody else? That's you and me. Right now, as the church, you are filled with the Spirit of God and you're sent in the world to go make as much money as you can. No, no to be a light in a dark place. Philippians, Philippians chapter two, verse 14, Paul says this, do some things without arguing, complaining. No, do all things, everything, he says, without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives, shining as bright lights in a world of crooked and perverse people. That's what the church is called to do now, to be filled with God's spirit, to be a light in dark places. And that's who these men will be for the nation of Israel. Now, who are these two witnesses? What's their identity? Are these the Cape Crusaders, Batman and Robin? Or are these the next two Avengers to join the Marvel Universe, right? Like, ultimately, we don't know with certainty. The, the text doesn't give clarity definitively. But there could be a strong case made that these men are none other than Moses, representing the law of God, and Elijah, representing the prophets of God. Why? Well, as it says in verse 3, they will be given great power. And look at verses 5 and 6, the kind of power of their ministry. Fire flashes from their mouths. They have power to shut up the sky so no rain will fall. 
I don't think this fire from this mouth from their mouth means that they're literally like Godzilla, just like spewing fire. But much like the lives of Moses and Elijah, they destroy their enemies by calling fire down from heaven. Elijah did that. Second Kings. These guys can call for a drought. Elijah did that. First Kings 17. They have the power to turn water into blood and strike the earth with various plagues. Does anyone remember another character in the Old Testament that rhymes with Gozus that did that? <laughs> Moses, right? And also, what's interesting is Moses and Elijah have already come back as a pair together. Remember the Mount Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, where Jesus is preparing to go to the cross. God sends Moses and Elijah. See, the 144,000 witnesses, if you don't know what we're talking about in that sense, I encourage you to go back and study some of the earlier teachings where these guys are mentioned. But God raises up these 144,000 evangelists to go throughout the globe to point people to Jesus. And then God sends these two very specific individuals to reach his people, the nation of Israel. Who better to reach them than Moses representing the law and potentially Elijah representing the prophets. And here's what we find that's so interesting. God protects them. I mean, if you're showing up Jerusalem in the Great Tribulation to do some commerce and you, you kind of get a kink in your chain because there's these guys calling down fire and all the water's been turned to blood, it's probably not going to get a great, like, um, not like a great review online. If my experience in Jerusalem was great, there's these two witnesses that kind of messed everything up. People are out to get them. But here's what's interesting. God protects them and uses them until their time is finished. Much like us. God's hand is upon us. But there does come a time, look at verse 7, where their ministry comes to an end. Look at verse 7 through verse 10. Verse 7 says, When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will declare war against them. He will conquer them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem. That city is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified. Verse 9, For three and a half years, Days, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. You see, in some sense, that statement in verse 7, in some sense, can and should bring a sense of clarity and comfort to our own lives. The two witnesses can't be touched until they complete their testimony. They're indestructible until God completes his purposes for them on earth. One author put it this way, in a similar way, every child of God doing the work of God and the will of God is invincible until God is finished with them. I think we'll be surprised when we get to heaven to realize how much God has walked us through those valleys of the shadow of death, those times when we didn't think we would make it and he was right there to sustain us. Until they completed their testimony, they were secure. They were safe. Now that doesn't mean just like live to the hilt in any way I want, right? Well, if that means that God's got me under his protection, bring on the burgers, pizza, Krispy Kreme and every day. And if I belong to God, nothing can touch me. No, by, by touching them, they'll leave their touch on you. That's how that works. But there is comfort in knowing that God's hand is upon his people, his protection and his provision. The psalmist spoke of this in Psalm 31. My times are in your hands. You see, in verse 7, we see the first mention of this individual, the beast, who's known as the Antichrist, that comes up from the bottomless pit. He will now be mentioned 36 more times in this book. And he opposes them 
face to face. And I love what Pastor Skip Heisek says about this. I'm going to put it up on the screen. He says, for three and a half years, the witnesses will interpret for the world all the cataclysms, the destruction, the hordes of demons, the, the heavens falling, the destruction of the sea. And they're going to say, this is God's judgment on wicked people. And do you think anything will like their message? He, anyone will like their message, he says. A righteous person is always a torment to a wicked person. A righteous person living in God's light shines that light upon those living in darkness and makes them feel deeply agitated. So the vast majority of the people of the world will hate these two witnesses and will want to destroy them. And on that day, God will allow it. The Antichrist, this beast, he'll be successful. And it says that their bodies will be left in the street for three and a half days. And whatever the communication is of that day, TikTok, Snapchat, whatever it is, people are going to be streaming this, so it says, to every tongue, every tribe, every nation in the world will see they're dead on the streets, staying in the streets for three and a half days. And here's what's bizarre. Amidst all the things that have gone on during this time of tribulation, the people celebrate. They start to give gifts to one another. It kind of becomes like a, a satanic anti-Christmas. Like, like they're celebrating the fact that God's messengers are dead. That they have been victorious over what God has tried to do. Look what it says, though, in verse 11. But after three and a half days, I love the way this is described. God breathed life into them and they stood up. Terror struck all those who were staring at them. A loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. This is amazing. Three and a half days after their death, people are celebrating, giving gifts, streaming, making probably like, you know, little video remixes, whatever people are doing. And all of a sudden, God breathes life. They stand to their feet. A loud voice from heaven says, come up. And they go up in a cloud. It strikes terror. And these men are essentially raptured. But look at what happens in verse 13. At the same time of this, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. 7,000 people died in that earthquake. And everyone else was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second terror is past, but look, the third terror is coming quickly. This is an amazing scene. Wouldn't you agree? For three and a half years, these two witnesses who seemingly have unbridled power, potency to their ministry and authority are taken out. And the world, there's this sense that, all right, we beat them. What, nothing can stop us now. And the men rise to their feet. A loud voice calls them to heaven. And as that's happening, the ground begins to shake. A tenth of the city is destroyed. 7,000 people are killed. It's devastating, mind-blowing. One author writes this. Many will change their minds about the two witnesses. Wouldn't that change your mind? Like if you saw that. They praise the God of heaven and begin a Jewish revival. And I like what this author says. I think it's a good point to make. Notice how good can come from things like earthquakes and death. God can use apparent disasters to bring about change. Let me be honest with you. I love that, and I don't. I love that good can come from challenging situations. I mean, I just think of this month two years ago. When, when Hurricane Sally kind of beat along our coastline, and specifically our little church called Coastline, 
Church flooded. Kids space, administrative space was out of commission for the, the better half of like six months. But you know, through that, we redesigned. We kind of like moved some things around on the church fellowship and opened up a new space for at that time our school, which was less than 50 kids, to have a little bit of capacity for growth. And it was totally redesigned to where now we've got 150 students. And in fact, this week, the portable, or as our principal would like to more describe it, the beach cottage, um, <laughs> will actually open tomorrow to allow for more space and more growth. I love that good can come from disaster. This area knows about that. But also, I, I don't love that. You say, what do you mean? I don't think we should wait for earthquakes and death to bring us to a place where our hearts are finally open to God. Like you want to learn from consequence, but it doesn't necessarily have to be your consequences that you learn. You can learn from the consequences that you see in others, right? Like if I go down that path, if I keep flirting with this, if I stay within this mindset, here's how that tape ends. See, God is faithful to pursue us. And like this author said, he can use good from evil. Absolutely. But you know what I love about God? In Romans chapter 2, Paul puts it this way. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't, can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. The best time to get right with God is now. Not to be like those who are coming against these two witnesses and it seems like, okay, well, we've, made some, we've conquered them. And, and then comes the earthquake, then comes the death. Don't wait for consequence or disaster, but respond to God's grace and God's kindness now. See, so often in life, we can interpret what seems like the delay of God as the okay of God. Well, God must be good because I know I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing, but hey, life still seems to hum right along. You've heard me say this so many times. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Sin will destroy you. God's commandments, God's word, those are his enablements by his spirit to live a life. We don't have to walk and live in those consequences of what sin brings. I grew up in the late 90s, was actually in a punk band, if you can believe that. And I remember there was a punk band back in the late 90s, early 2000s, that had a song called The Sugar-Coated Poison Apple. They were a Christian band at that time. I don't know if they still are, but I won't mention the name. But that's a great picture of what sin is. The sugar-coated poison apple. Tastes sweet, looks good, but man, it's going to destroy. See, God in this chapter, throughout this book of Revelation, especially in this series that we're in, we see his mercy. He's sending witnesses. He's got these two individuals that are explaining all that's going on. They're wearing the fashion to draw the people towards repentance, doing everything he can to say, come to God. And even as these two witnesses go up, there, there's judgment because why? God is God. He has the ability to be the righteous, rightful judge. And some respond. But it's God's kindness that is intended to turn you from sin. Don't misinterpret his grace. Don't misinterpret his delay of judgment as an okay for sin. Well, let's wrap this chapter up. Look at verse 15. It says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. This may be a little confusing, but the seventh trumpet sound here is heaven's declaration that the Father and the Son are now focused and taking over. We say, what do you mean by that? 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Paul says, when, when the end comes, Jesus 
delivers the kingdom to his father and puts an end to the rule and all authority and power. The, the seventh trumpet brings on the final plagues that will happen. Like it says in Revelation 15, 1, that's when God's wrath is fully complete. But it's like the seventh trumpet is basically answering this question that many have always had. When will God make everything right? This is what the trumpet announces. Now. It's happening now. God's mercy and grace is now ushering in God's judgment and justice. So verse 16, the 24 elders who are in heaven sitting on their thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and they worshiped him. And they said, we give thanks to you, Lord, our God, the Almighty, the one who is, who always was. For now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. Does not mean God's not reigning throughout the entire time. It means that he's now bringing the justice. The 24 elders in heaven representing the church worship God. The kingdom is coming to its fullness. They thank God for his sovereign power and willingness to use it. And then what's said in verse 18, it kind of encompasses this entire tribulation and the millennium to follow. Look at verse 18. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It's time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people. And all who fear your name, from the least to the greatest, it's time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. This is kind of a summary of the book of Revelation in the sense that God is revealing his son and bringing justice to a Christ-rejecting world. And then in verse 19, then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed and roared. There was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. As John sees this heavenly picture, it's like an open house, so to speak, of what's going on. And amidst all this rumbling of judgment, he sees the ark, the ark of the covenant. Signifying that in heaven, we will realize God's full covenant of fellowship with him. See, when the blood was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, it became known as the mercy seat. The mercy seat. It was that place where God met with man in the holiest of holies. And this is the point and the purpose of God in the book of Revelation, to bring individuals into fellowship with him. As all this judgment is going on, it's like John sees what's at the center of the temple, it's God's presence. It's that Ark of the Covenant that represented that place where God and man could have fellowship. As we mentioned in worship this morning, that happens through one individual. We've done a couple of pop quizzes this morning. Let's see if you can get this one right. <laughs> Who's the one individual that makes it possible for you and I to have fellowship with God based on his life, perfect life, Death, burial, resurrection. His name rhymes with Mises, but who is he? Jesus. Jesus. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, you and I can have fellowship with him. And through Revelation chapter 11, this is what the purpose of those witnesses. They're calling people to repentance, to change. The world is so ingrained in their own mindset that they are God kind of like that little video that we watched this morning, that they are vehemently opposed to him, feeling like they could conquer him. And when they feel like they do, they say, let's just set up an anti-Christmas, right? Let's give gifts. And it's like God gives them three and a half days. <laughs> and he raises those two witnesses, calls them up. God has every right to judge. He's God. Years ago, there used to be this little, like, Jesus is my homeboy. Do you remember that? I mean, you may not remember that, but like, like for some reason, there's that mindset with God that he's just an actor in our great grandiose play of life. 
And I sure wish he'd get on board with my story, right? And that's not who he is. He's the creator. You're the created. I'm the created. And he's a God of love. And he's a God of justice, or else he would not be God. And in his love, he sent his son. And in his justice, he will right every wrong. And he will rule righteously. The best thing you can do with your life right now is to give it to him. Walk in a love relationship with him. That's why you obey, because you love him. You're thankful for him. You begin to love on his people. That's who he loves. It's very difficult to say, God, I love you, but I don't like your people. It doesn't work. That's who he loves. And the most practical way you can love God is by loving one another. Husbands and wives, it gets really clear, Ephesians 5, of what that love looks like. Parents and children, employee, employer. It's laid out there in the New, in the New Testament. Well, what's love look like? It's ever so practical. It's kind. It's patient. These are active words, not passive words. 1 Corinthians 13. God's called you into a love relationship with him. I pray as we close out Revelation 11 this morning that we're given insight, that we're informed as what's to come, but we're also encouraged of how to live right now in love with him and his people. And just like these two witnesses, filled with his spirit, going into dark places to be light. There's so many who walk in darkness. I want to encourage you this week to be praying, to be open, to be sharing the good news of who Jesus is, to be light, to be salt, to be filled with his spirit, to love God, to love people, and to be about making disciples. That's the sweet spot of your life as a believer.